This is an interview with Robert F. Goheen, the 16th president of Princeton, conducted in his home on October 21st, 2004. President Goheen, um, what we hope to do with these interviews is not look for a recitation of facts by any means, but to record your thoughts and assumptions about various issues in your life and presidency at Princeton. Uh, we'd like to capture um, how your thoughts evolved okay. or what you were feeling at the time. Um, so we hope to see this as a chance to record um, some aspects of major issues in your life um, in ways that may not have been possible until now. But um, I want to start by asking you about how you came to Princeton. You grew up in India um, before traveling to the United States to attend high school here. How did you decide to attend Princeton? Well, my parents were medical missionaries in India, uh, uh, Presbyterians, I should add, and had something of a tie to the theological seminary here. One of my grandfathers, who had also been a missionary in India, uh, upon retirement joined the seminary uh, faculty. And uh, when we came to this country in late 28 for the s furlough that my family was allowed every seven years or so, uh, we came and lived in the missionary apartments on Alexander Street and my grandmother was living just up the street. So I had uh, there when I was about 10, 11, going to 12, a few years of experience here in this country. And then I went back to India and was shipped home in 1934 to finish high school here. And I was fortunate enough to, or my parents were influential enough to have got me a nice scholarship so I could go to Lawrenceville as a, as a day boy. And I did that for two years and then came with more than 50% of my Lawrenceville class came to Princeton. Wow. You say you were a day boy at Lawrenceville. Uh, where, where did you live? I lived with uh, one of my sisters who was then teaching at Miss Fine School, the old Miss Fine School, located where Borough Hall is now located. How do you think growing up in a, another culture uh, contributed to your education? Oh, I, it, 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 it's a subtle way, but I think very importantly, I, I've always had a feeling that Growing up in a, a different culture, or growing up in a culture like India, which is very different, uh, helps to give you a perspective on your own culture. And not just take it for granted, but to see its pluses and minuses more sharply than one would otherwise. Do you think there's anything specific to growing up in India that influenced you? Well, I, I had a wonderful boyhood. I, uh, in India, growing up on the west coast, where we had beaches be as good as Goa's or better, and then going to school for eight months a year down in South India, the Paldi Hills, which are absolutely beautiful low rolling mountains like the Alleghenies. And our school was at about 7,000 feet. We did a lot of hiking and camping and swimming. It was, it was a good life. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Bob, um, I think it would also help for the, the look if, uh, from time to time if you could just exchange glances with Dan. And yeah. That way you, it comes up a little sure, bit in the morning. Sure. Let's talk about your time at Princeton. When you were an undergraduate, what were your professional ambitions? I don't think I had any. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I entered uh, with just a desire to get a good education and then see where, where it would take me. 
in the course of my sophomore year, I took a course in Greek literature and translation with Professor Whitney J. Oates, and that convinced me that I wanted to learn Greek, and I worked hard at that and ended up really doing my senior thesis on Greek tragedy, and that sort of the, the faculty then kind of directed me toward graduate school, and I just drifted along, enjoying things thoroughly. Now you say you drifted along, but um, when you were an undergraduate, what do you think um, was your most significant undergrad uh, extracurricular activity? Oh, clearly playing on the soccer team. Yeah. We won the Middle Atlantic Championships three years in a row when I was a sophomore and then again when I was a senior. And uh, we had a very, uh, very collegial group of, of guys who were playing soccer. And we enjoyed one another a lot. It was, was, was very good, yeah. I'm wondering, you mentioned you sort of drifted along and pushed into graduate school. Why did you choose to attend graduate school at Princeton? What factors uh, influenced because you? Because Princeton gave me a better scholarship than <laughs> Harvard, Chicago, or North Carolina. It was as simple as that. <laughs> did you go visit the other schools or? No, I, 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 I didn't. One thing I didn't have as an undergraduate or graduate student was much free cash. I, uh, <coughs> I <coughs> when I was an undergraduate, I uh, did a variety of student jobs, taking tickets at sports events, moving furniture in the then furniture exchange until my end of my sophomore year when the university gave me a Hibben scholarship, which really took care of my expenses associated with college life, but didn't let me go party in New York or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, we can talk a little bit about your wartime service, since that interrupted right. the, the two. Uh, periods of schooling. You were inducted as a private and a few years later you mustered out as a lieutenant colonel. How much well, do you want to share? Well, from I had a, a, a very unusual and I would say really soft army life. I was drafted on the 1st of October of, of 41 and, went, uh, and did basic training down at Camp Cross, South Carolina in Spartansburg. And I was there when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, I think all of us who were co college graduates were invited to apply for officers' training, infantry officers. And uh, I was accepted and went to Fort Benning and did three months there. And then uh, because my records showed I in India knew something about that part of the world. Strangely, I got sent to the War Department as my first posting in the G2 section, intelligence section of the War Department, working on what was then called the British Empire branch. And uh, it was astounding how, how little our country had and paying any attention to South Asia in a military sense. Our records are the flimsiest kinds of files that we had on what was going, had been going on over there. And one of my jobs was to sp spend a lot of time in the Library of Congress and other things, bringing information together that would be useful for that section. And one of the fortuitous things about it was the the second ranking officer in that branch was Dean Rusk, who later went on to become a Secretary of State. And uh, while I was serving in Washington, 
became a good friend and we used to play tennis together after after hours. And his wife and he were both very, very uh, helpful to Margaret and me who were still youngsters, but by that time already had a baby on their hands, so we, they, were, they were very helpful to us. Did you remain in touch with him when he was in, when he was serving? Yes, I've had, I've, until he moved down to Georgia, to, I was in touch with him periodically. When you returned to Princeton after the war, what changes did you notice? What struck you? Well, it soon became more crowded as returning veterans, uh, both uh, Princetonians and... I want to stop uh, waiting for the bells to go. Okay, can you, you want to ask that question again? Sure. Um, when you returned to Princeton after the war, what was most striking to you? I, I think that it suddenly became much more uh, crowded and that uh, not only were returning alumni veterans uh, appearing, but uh, other veterans who, to whom the GI Bill uh, made it possible to think of coming to a place like this. Uh, and indeed for the several months, uh, really for the first semester of that year, I, I worked in the dean's office in Nassau Hall part of each day trying to help process these, uh, these applicants who, some of them who by Princeton standards were, were not strange, but their backgrounds were very different than what admissions people had been used to. What's, how were they different? Oh, they just said, Uh, well, for one thing, they were they were more mature. Uh, they didn't put up any gaff. Uh, <laughs> and, but uh, many of them came from what I would call simpler homes than most of the Princeton students did. Mm -hmm. So the student body, undergraduate student body, swelled by about 600, went from about 2,000 to 26 under there within a year or two of the end of the war. You mentioned the dean's office that you worked in. Do you recall who? It was uh, uh, under, um, uh, I worked with, with, with Dean Finch, but the, oh my, here's, here's my 85-year-old memory. <laughs> uh, wonderful dean of the faculty really was in charge of that. And that will come back to me. That's okay. If it comes back to you, let us know. You then went from graduate school at Princeton to becoming a faculty member. Yeah. How was that transition? How did tell us a little bit about that? Well, I guess I was lucky in that there was a vacancy in the faculty at the lower ranks, and uh, they seemed to think I. I'd done a, doing a good job in teaching, and I'd written a small book which drew an inordinate, well, to do an unusual amount of attention because it was different uh, for, from what most classicists uh, had been doing or thinking about. Uh, I, I, the new criticism was then the rage in literary studies, and I took the principles of the new criticism and applied them to the Antigone, a play by Sophocles, and it proved to be very illuminating. And so suddenly I got a, a kind of scholarly reputation which I didn't deserve. I just happened to hit the right subject at the right time, because <laughs> nobody else had done that yet. So it was your dissertation that you turned into a book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many years did it take you to complete your doctorate? Well, I, if you start back in 1941, <laughs> it took seven. But cut out the war years, it took me three years. OK. <laughs> 
So how did it feel to be among... Dean, Dean Root, Dean Robert Root is the name I was trying to remember. See, that memory's not so bad. So how did it feel to be among the faculty of people who not so long ago were teaching you as either a graduate student or even undergraduate students? Well, I mean, we were a very collegial uh, department on the whole and a small department. Uh, there were a few uh, very senior people who were more deferentially treated than uh, the rest, the rest of them. Take a pause for the uh, phone wow. to go. <coughs> what? The phone, the phone was ringing. And I think it's done. So we can continue where we were. Okay. Can we pick up just where? Uh, it was like, had like into that last sentence. So if we could repeat that last sentence. Uh, you were about to say there was a senior faculty member. There, there were uh, really t two senior faculty, very, quite senior faculty members who were treated more deferentially than the rest of it is an interesting period because the same Whitney J. Oates we knew, knew as Mike and the dean of the college, Francis Godolphin, also a classicist, uh, both were very interested in making the classics interested, interest, uh, interesting and available to the whole student body and uh, were not the purists about you had to know Latin and Greek in order to learn Latin history or, or Greek history. And the middle ranks of the department were, were those progressively minded people to whom I responded and who responded to me. Uh, it was a great group of people, but small. Mm. One thing I'm going to do throughout the series of interviews is to just sort of reflect on certain people. And since you've mentioned him, um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what you remember about uh, Professor Oates? Well, uh, Mike Oates was a remarkable uh, human being, besides being a, a very good lecturer and, and demanding teacher. Uh, he had a genius for uh, taking ideas and, and seeing that they got it implemented, even institutionalized. I mean, I mentioned to you earlier that he, he really was the guiding spirit and pusher of the Humanities Council, which he was the first chairman of. Uh, he, he was very active with people from other universities in developing the language for the National Humanities Center National Endowment of the Humanities when it was set up in Washington. Uh, he, uh, with some other people again from Princeton, including Rensley and the Art Department, really bailed out the American Council of Learned Societies when after the war it was in trouble and a number of these people rallied around and helped it raise funds and Get, get on a sound footing again. So he had these other gifts as well as being a wonderful teacher and a, and a very close personal friend. Mm -hmm. How would you describe him as a colleague? What's that? How would you describe him as a colleague? Uh, friendly and lenient, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was he known for anything in particular in way of habits or personality? Oh, he, he smoked like a I, uh, terribly heavily. I did. I smoked quite a bit myself, but I never tried to keep up with him. <laughs> uh, and he had one habit that he he, he invented nicknames for people. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, often, if he didn't have a special one, he called you Uncle, yeah, Uncle Robert, or something like that. Uh, did he have a but nickname? Otherwise, he's a very <laughs> normal person. Did he have a nickname for you? I I say he called me Uncle Robert sometimes. Okay. Because I'd outranked him in the military. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The um, process of you becoming president is 
in a number of sources and uh, in your own words and others. But if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you indulge me and just tell me a little bit about how you became president? Well, it's a mystery to me. I, uh, after the presidential search had been going on a while, uh, a number of my faculty friends say, we hear you're on the list. And I said, well, that's nonsense. Look around the faculty. There are people like uh, Jinx Harbison, Harry Hess, Henry Smythe, very, all senior and very active, very able, very highly respected faculty members. Why would they look at a youngster like me with uh, none of that academic standing and not nearly as much worldly experience as they have? Uh, but for some reason, they they did. And I'll tell you a story, uh, partly how that happened. Uh, one of the senior trustees was Dean Matty, class of 12, who owned a wonderful home out near where the Princeton Day School is now. And uh, in the summertime, three or four of us faculty people would quite often get together in the late afternoon and pl play nine holes of golf. And occasionally, Dean Matty would join us. So he got to know me as an individual. Uh, one day he said, Bob, the trustees are, are meeting and we've talked to a lot of senior people in Princeton and out of Princeton. We haven't got any other point of view of younger faculty people. What, what do you feel about the university and people who might be good president? So I said, well, that's very nice, Dean. I, I'll do what I can. So I went out to his home, and there were about, I guess, 12 or 13 other trustees there. And uh, we chatted, and I was completely relaxed. I didn't think it related to me at all. I told him quite candidly what I thought about Princeton and what some of its problems were and what its tremendous potential was and about individuals who I thought would be or not be good presidents. So I, I had a ball. <laughs> <laughs> and th then a few days later, I received a call from John Rockefeller's office in New York, and John was a trustee. That Mr. Rockefeller would like to come in and, uh, and have me come in and see him. Well. I, I had an I had a tentative application in, into the Rockefeller Brothers Fund for a job because uh, I felt I needed more mo money than Princeton was paying me. And so I thought that was what this was about. So I went in and we talked not about that. We talked mainly about Princeton and, and he said he's on the search and what they came out. And, but I still didn't think this was really terribly relevant to me. Uh, this is going on and on, this story, but it's kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, Yale weekend came up, and my college roommate, who happened to be a vice president in the chemical bank, whose chairman was Harold Helm, the chairman of the executive committee of Princeton at that time, I lived in Darien. And Margaret and I, went up Friday to s spend the weekend with the Platons and go up to the football game on Saturday and then come back home Sunday. And <laughs> during supper Friday night, uh, the phone rang and Don called me. He said, oh, Mr. Helm's on the phone. He wants to talk with you. And I said, what in the world about? And so anyhow, I went to this Mr. Helm said, some of us trustees would like to meet with you Sunday morning in New York. And uh, can you make it? And I said, Mr. Helm, it's a great honor, but right now I'm with my roommate and his wife, and, and we don't get away very often, and can't it be some other time? <laughs> 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 uh, 
And he said, no, he, I said, he said, I think it's important. You better come. Well, then I started to get some butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday morning, Margaret put me on the train and in, I guess, Stanford. And I went to New York and went to the apartment which the chemical bank had there. And there were five trustees, uh, the senior most of the trustees. And uh, we chatted a little while. They gave me a glass of sherry. And they said they wanted me to be president of the university. And I almost went through the floor, but <laughs> I said, yes, I, I, I would try it. I didn't even told Margaret I was interested. <laughs> yeah. How did she respond when you got home that well, night? Well, she, she was a bit shocked, but she's a great trooper and you know, always tremendously supportive. If we can go back to that first meeting with the trustees, right. uh, when you said you felt relaxed and you told them a number of things sure. about what Princeton could be and what's, yeah. at, at that point in time, what, what did you tell them? And, what did you see? Well, let me back up a little bit. I, for three previous years, been on loan from the university half time to the Association of Graduate Schools and had run the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Program for them. And that would take me around to a whole lot of other universities and colleges. And I came away with a sense that there really was something special about Princeton. That it, it was a college and university in one. There was a singleness to it, to this duality, which there was not on most, in most places. Uh, I think in great measure because it's been part of the tradition and because uh, we really have a, a faculty of teachers, scholars, and have expected not everybody, but virtually everybody, uh, to be a working teacher as well as a good scholar. Uh, so that was my theme. That this is something very, very, very special. That I thought the university was overcrowded. That I thought there were problems in the club system that needed to be addressed. <laughs> Again, <laughs> and. Uh, I don't think I complained about my salary. I don't. <laughs> I don't know what else I told them. But that was that was the gist of it. And you said you also talked about what Princeton could be. What, what well, did you envision? Clearly, World War II made a difference to higher education in this country, not only in bringing in this influx of people supported by the GI Bill, which was one of the great things this American government has ever done. But also, I think, raising uh, the sites of universities, especially in science, but the others tagging along, uh, as to the importance of the scholarly dimension of uh, university. I mean, it's then that you begin hearing about research universities instead of just universities. And I thought that the graduate school at Princeton needed to be enlarged and strengthened, and uh, uh, that that could be done without uh, destroying this unity I was speaking about beforehand. Hmm. You were 37, is that right, when you became president? Looking back from age 85, what are your feelings about that? Oh, incredible. That's incredible. But uh, it's interesting that for some reason, that I, not for some reason, I think those of us who served in the war, even though we served different, got a kind of maturing and came back expecting to be treated like adults and, and were treated that way beyond probably our our, our years normally would have, would have allowed. Uh, at the same time, uh, identically at the same time, I became president of Princeton. William Friday became president 
of the University of North Carolina, and our birthdays are about six weeks apart. And very soon after, Kingman Brewster went to Yale about three or four years later. Probably not more than 40, 41, something like that. Uh, Jim Hester, a Princetonian, became head of the uh, uh, New York University, probably early 40s. So there was a youth movement there. And I think a lot of it has to do with, the, with our experience in the war and what people came to think of, <laughs> of veterans, probably more than they should have, but what they thought we could do. Also touching upon um, something you mentioned, you, you brought up Dean Mabby. Yeah. And he's someone else, uh, if you could just reflect on him, how you knew him and what he was like as a person. Well, I got to know Dean, as I, I say, through these occasional casual golf encounters. And I found him always very friendly and open and not standing on a, uh, his high horse as a difference between a trustee and an assistant professor. Uh, he had a quite lively sense of humor. Uh, strong attachment to, to Georgian architecture. <laughs> uh, for many years was head of the Grounds and Buildings Committee of the board and was one of the reasons, uh, that was one of the reasons why Princeton was rather late in moving into uh, more modern uh, forms of architecture on the campus. Mm -hmm. But I was very fond of Dean. He was uh, always gracious toward Margaret and me. And you mentioned tremendously generous to the university. I should add that. You mentioned he had a sense of humor. Can you think of any particular episode that highlights That's that? That's one thing I'm not good at, Dan. I, <laughs> uh, I just think of the twinkle in his eye and the stories he loved to tell, but I can't could tell you any any of them. Mm. It's okay. Now, President Dodds survived mm -hmm. uh, through the entirety of your tenure as university president. Can you tell me a little bit about what sort of relationship you had with him? Well, again, there's a, a sort of peculiar beginning. Uh, Harold Dodds' brother uh, was the uh, administrative head of the Presbyterian mission in Western India that my parents were associated with. Ah. And because of that, when I was living with my sister Alice here as a day boy at Lawrenceville, uh, several times we were invited to the Dodds because they had some nephews about my age visiting them. So I first got to know them on a personal basis that way. Not a close personal basis, but anyhow, he, he recognized me. And mm -hmm. I, uh, mm -hmm. uh, once I returned from the war as a graduate student and then faculty member, uh, I really wasn't very conscious of, of the president. He, he was doing his job and I, I was doing mine. But, but we were friendly and he continued to recognize me. Uh, he did a tremendous amount for Princeton, holding it together uh, and upholding its standards, both during the Great Depression and then the war. Those were very tough times. And he, he, he not only held it together, he, he made some very good faculty appointments to, Strengthen for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you consult with him at all once you were named president? Uh, he, uh, he, he, he said, those are your problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about during the transition? You were named president at the end of 56, and you didn't assume office until middle of 57. Yeah. Did you work with him at all during that time? I, I, uh, I certainly must have 
talk with him a few times, but basically I, tr I tried to stay out of his way. The university moved me into a, a little apartment on Alexander Street, and I s set up an office there. And the same street where your grandmother lived. Uh, yeah, I, should, I you, you got me in a slip oh. on University Place, not oh. Alexander oh. Street. Okay. And the same house in which Maddie College was housed for a little while. Uh, and I used that opportunity to invite the vice presidents and departmental chairman in to come and tell me what they thought, what they, what, what they were concerned about. Uh, but I tried to stay off the campus, out of the presence here. Mm. Did he have any um, conversations with you about previous Princeton presidents? Did he ever talk about uh, Hibben or? He, he just told me that President Hibben had offered something like f two, two hours a week, twice a day, I mean two hours twice a week. And that's how he ran the presidency. By Harold's time already, the various bureaucracies were closing in, piling up work. <laughs> <laughs> you can't think of Shirley Tillman on that kind of a schedule <laughs> now. No. Oh. You mentioned um, Dodd's choices to, for faculty. Um, how did you perceive your role in faculty building? Oh, I thought it was critical. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I thought being engaged in it was critical. And I religiously attended the meetings of the so, well, so-called Committee of Three, which in fact the president chairs. But I, I did my homework for them and took part in the discussion. And I'm not sure that I influenced any choices, but I, I thought not only was it, not, I, it was educational for me, but I thought that symbolically also it was important that the president be involved in, in such matters. Mm -hmm. Who served on the Committee of Three at that time? Well, the Committee of Three at that time included three elected faculty people, one from the sciences and engineering, one from the humanities, one from the social science, and it normally, normally sat with it the dean, the dean of the faculty. Uh, sometimes the dean of the graduate school, uh, and the president. Uh, pretty soon it became a committee of four with a separate representation for the engineering school, and then uh, since then it's gone to an elect elective system, which, I don't know, I think there are five or six faculty representatives mm -hmm. elected by the faculty on that committee. Mm -hmm. Did you have any authority to overturn their uh, decisions, or, and did you ever exercise that? Oh, I had the authority to do it, there's no question about it. Uh, I think I demurred enough in two cases to maybe, ch maybe change the vote from a positive to a negative, but basically I, 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 didn't, I didn't expect to change the vote of the, of the faculty members. Mm -hmm. So how did the process work then in terms of your participation in faculty hiring? Well, the dean of the faculty's office would pull together all this data that had been gathered, f not from just inside the college, but from the scholarly community of the country and around the world, about the given individual who was being considered for appointment or promotion. Mm -hmm. And then one read that material, and on certain given nights you met with the committee and we discussed it. And, and uh, I think the this is a wild general. The more difficult cases had to do with internal promotions to tenure, uh, as against external appointments. Mm. 
probably because we didn't know as much about the external people. <laughs> <laughs> now, in reading about you uh, to prepare for this, you were described by one faculty member as having the memory of an elephant with the patience of Job. <laughs> Now, how yeah. would you describe your relationship with the Princeton faculty over you? Well, years? I used to have a very good memory, short-term memory. <laughs> it got through me through many exams of courses that I didn't, or I didn't know the material as well as they thought I did. Uh, and I was a very fast reader. Uh, all those, those two skills have vanished. <laughs> uh, but they impressed I've the faculty. I always believed in listening to people. I thought I had patience. I, I, I think I'm sure I got this from my, my, my mother and dad. They, people got grievances. Hear, hear them out. Try, try to find out really what's, what's bugging them and what's going on. And I, I think I was a pretty good listener. Anything else you want to add about your relationship with the faculty? Um. Well, I felt that I had a very uh, s strong and good relationship uh, with the faculty, uh, especially, of course, with the departmental chairman, whom I appointed, <laughs> and, but then with many, many, many others. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the curriculum. When yeah. you became president, how did you want to affect the curriculum at the university? Well, this is interesting because this is a theme that has come up over again. Harold Shapiro pushing it, Shirley's pushing it, getting more world or international con uh, content into the curriculum. Uh, we what did you do to try and bring that about? Well, a number of things. We had the uh, Center for International Studies uh, here, and I tried to be sure that it was well-funded and able to bring in visiting scholars and so on. Uh, we had a very strong Near Eastern program and budding strength in Chinese and Japanese, and I pushed the development of those three departments. Uh, and I'd say, by parenthetically, it was very difficult in some cases for me because I'm a S South Asian person, and I'd have loved to have gotten South Asian studies going, but. Uh, Princeton Lee, Princeton runs a, a tight ship and you don't do just everything you want to do. There were very good programs in South Asian studies, both at Columbia and Penn, well established. And I knew we couldn't get there and compete with them right away. So I thought we should build on strength rather than spread ourselves out. Mm -hmm. What areas did you see as strengths at that point? The areas that I, I, I mentioned these area programs, uh, Japanese, well, I first Far Eastern, then of course ja split into Japanese and Chinese, and the Near Eastern program that Philip Hitty established here. Mm -hmm. There's um, just a couple of other people I'd like to ask you about. Okay. Uh, one is Robert Oppenheimer, director of the Institute. Yeah. Oh, sure. I know, knew Robert. Uh, Robert and I had, I think, respectful uh, and good relations. Uh, we never asked much of, much of each other. Uh, we, we agreed that the, that the Institute would not raid the Princeton faculty for 
uh, members, which he he felt strongly about as I did, that that changed uh, later on. <laughs> uh, but we we were we were never never close. I never talked politics with him. I never uh, got got into any of that. I was deeply sympathetic with the with him and the trials through which he was put in, in, in Washington after the war. But uh, I don't have much more to say than that. Okay. Okay. Um, another character, um, Freddie Fox. Oh. Well, Freddie was a class ahead of me in college and also a member of the Quadrangle Club, so I'd known him then. Uh, our paths crossed in the in the war when he was in military intelligence and I brought him to our division where I was working in that area. And I remember after the war, his working in Washington with I think Eisner, our people for people program or something of that mm -hmm. sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he uh, when that had kind of run its course, at least so far as he was concerned, he was interested in coming and joining the Princeton administration, and we welcomed him. Yeah. He was a he was a wonderful character, unique. Yeah. Do you have any particularly fond memories of him? Episodes or I have very strong general impressions of. Freddie, but I don't have episodes. <laughs> you know. When you were university president, you gave a lot of addresses, okay. more so than the modern presidents uh, do today. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, how did you keep up with all the writing? Who were your advisors, editors, writers? Well, I, I didn't have a, any regular speechwriter that has, seems to have become common. Uh, but I had various people I would call on for help if I writing about the undergraduate college. I'd get the dean of the college to draft some stuff for me, and, or the graduate school, or the engineering school, or whatever it might be. Uh, I had pretty much my own ideas about liberal education, and I I could grind those out without too much trouble. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. At one point in the reading I did, um, you talked about loving Princeton and loving the job of being president of Princeton. Can t you tell me what was there to love about Princeton? Oh, how can you ask? I mean, it just it's been part of my life since I was a, a kid, and then I had very much part of it, you know. And what did I love about the job? It was a tremendous feeling to have responsibility for a place as important as Princeton and to try to see that it does the best it can with the means it has or can find uh, to be better. You know. I think that's a good place to stop. Okay. So, thank you very much.